Hey everybody, this is the Scholar General Mojan Bing. Today I have an extra special video. It's an interview with Professor David Graff. Now, David Graff received his PhD in East Asian Studies from Princeton University and has since gone on to publish numerous works about Chinese military history. His specialty is the Tang Dynasty. He wrote a book, The Medieval Chinese Warfare from 300 to 900. And uh, that's a great book if you've ever picked up a copy. <laughs> Another good book that, I, that we're gonna talk about today is the Eurasian Way of War, Military Practice in 7th Century China and Byzantium. Um, he currently serves as the chair of the history department at Kansas State University and is the director of the undergraduate East Asian Studies program. All right, so David Graff, thanks for coming on. Okay, glad to be here. Yeah, so uh, first uh, I wanna start out with this interesting question in academia, comparative study is becoming more popular than it used to be in some ways. And, um, but I think that there's an interesting um, tension almost between uh, how we do comparative studies because in my world here on the internet, <laughs> people love to do all kinds of uh, somewhat, sometimes ludicrous comparisons like knight versus samurai or like all this other stuff. So yeah. how do we, how, whenever we do comparative studies, how do we ground things in, um, more of what we can actually know in academic reality. Yeah. Well, I think um, in, in um, academic comparative studies, you know, done by historians, yeah. um, I think there is a preference for uh, trying to um, kind of limit the variability as much as possible in comparison. Mm -hmm. It's not always done this way, but it's, it's generally considered you know, the best practice uh, to try to say, look at, um, the same chronological period, but for yeah. you know, two different uh, geographical parts of the world, yeah. or uh, to uh, consider kind of social structures or political structures that are you know comparable in a lot of ways, and that that's mm -hmm. what I was kind of trying to do in yes. my book, compare comparing Tang China with Byzantium. I was trying to mm -hmm. look at kind of approximately the same period, kind of early seventh century CE and um, dealing with kind of two um, moderately large you know, bureaucratic empires. Yes, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's really interesting. And another, uh, I think another key distinction is your uh, reliance on, you know, the primary source material. And the, um, it's very impressive. Uh, you, because a lot of many scholars are not able to kind of bridge these gaps and I understand that you work closely with some of your colleagues and friends and really digging down at the, the Byzantium side of things. Mm -hmm. um, could you speak a little bit about your main sources that you used in comparing yeah. these things? Yeah, certainly. And one, one um, aspect of the comparison that really makes it you know, workable is that we have um, important primary source material from both the uh, Tang Chinese side and the Byzantine side. And for the Tang side, it is the what, what's left of the writings of Li Jing, who was a um, early, very important uh, early Tang general, and um, wrote really about uh, the um, really the, the nitty gritty aspects of um, running an army. So you know, training, you know, formations, um, the layout of the camp, um, you know, security of the camp, and, and so forth. And, yeah. You know, great detail. And uh, then on the Byzantine side, uh, we have uh, the Strategicon um, mm. that is kind of conventionally attributed to the Emperor uh, Maurice or Mauritius, yeah. um, who uh, ruled from you know, 582 to 602. Mm -hmm. And it's probably not actually written by Mauritius himself. Yeah. But odds are by, by someone in his entourage or kind of close to him. And it has very similar sorts of material in it. Yeah. And, and um, I read uh, the Chinese materials just fine. You know, mm -hmm. uh, classical Chinese from the Tang and you know, Song periods is, is you know, not a problem for me. So I can do my own um, primary source research there, but mm -hmm. not on the Byzantine side. I've, I've, yeah. I've never studied Greek. Greek, yeah. So, uh, and and the, the sources are in, you know, there in medieval Greek. Yeah, so I'm really fortunate to be um, standing on the shoulders of, of giants, of 
um, Byzantinists who really did a lot of work translating um, important military texts into English and then uh, writing um, books and articles kind of explaining those texts. And, you know, the one individual who really deserves the uh, biggest uh, uh, shout out is uh, Father George Dennis, uh, the, the uh, late George Dennis, who uh, translated the uh, Strategicon into English and also translated a number of other uh, Byzantine military works. Mm -hmm. And you know, with without his scholarship, you know, my book would not have been written, or it would have been you know something kind of very different, you know, much more kind of focused on the Tang side, less on Byzantium, but kind of the Byzantine you know comparison, kind of an afterthought rather than half the book. Yeah, yeah, and that's um, that's really great that you were able to rely on that tradition of ancient Greek that text, military texts that have been translated into English. I know that you're working on translating uh, Li Jing's work into English because one thing about a lot of Chinese history is much of the material it still remains untranslated. Yeah, um, and that's always a struggle <laughs> if yeah. you don't know the Chinese. But right. Chinese yeah. is very difficult to learn, but it's so worth it when you do. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. That, that's uh, but once you you learn Chinese, I mean the the um, <laughs> you especially classical Chinese, you know, that just opens up a huge body of literature. Yeah, yeah, and it's the, thousands of years of all kinds yeah, of material, all kinds yeah, of topics. Yeah, and so. the, the, the meanings do of terms and the, the um, structure of the language, you know, varies a bit from dynasty to dynasty, period to period, but that's not insurmountable. So it's, it's not like the you know, difference, say, between um, you know, modern English and Chaucer's English and Elizabethan English in between. It's yeah, exactly. Like they, the, they weren't really working with vernacular Chinese up until like the 20th century in many ways. So they preserved that literary language and they were still using it. So that makes it easy, makes it easy for us to go back and reach those ancient texts. So, um, yeah, you're working on translating that in English. Do you have any time frame for that? Or are you just? Hey, it's, um, you know, I've really, I've finished the basic translation some time ago. So I've, I've got it translated. And what's holding me up now are several things. Um, first and most importantly, all of my administrative responsibilities as a, yeah. uh, as a uh, department head here at Kansas State University, uh, which uh, takes an awful lot of time. Um, but uh, looking at the work itself, I'm still kind of agonizing over how best to translate some of the key terms. Uh, so, yes, that's so always it's, a problem. <laughs> it's kind of, you know, technical terms for certain sorts of military units, kind of certain um, command positions, and I've been agonizing a lot about that, and also uh, just the, the, there's the need to finish the introduction so that the translation is done except for a little bit of tweaking, but the introduction is only about half written, and the introduction opens lots of cans of worms. So I, I've done the easy part, which is Li Jing's biography. Um, but I still need to tie the work in with the uh, Tang military law and with, with the, the whole Tang legal system because a you know, big chunk of, of the work is basically military law. Um, okay. And I have to think about how it relates to, to other works. For example, the um, uh, Tang Taizong um, uh, Li Wei Gong Wen Dui, the um, dialogues between the emperor uh, Tang Taizong and uh, Li Jing that um, appear in the seven military or the, the classics. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, what's the relationship between that and the material I've translated that's drawn from the um, encyclopedia, the, the Tongdian, compiled by Du Yo leading into 800 CE. So, um, how does you know, what I'm dealing with relate to this other work? And, you know, I'm, as for a lot of reasons, I'm you know, forced to conclude that, you know, the text that appears in the seven military classics is, you know, a later fabrication. 
uh -huh. the overlap is very small. There's a little bit, but it's really very, very little. And um, and I'm, I'm not going to give all my reasons. I wrote a paper giving like eight reasons for why we can't trust the questions and replies. Um, but um, it's uh, you know there's there's very little overlap, um, and the. Uh, questions and replies is a brilliant work, but it's, um, I think, and I think Peter Lorge would agree with me on this, that it is um, really responding to some concerns, yeah. not top ones. Yeah. And um, it really, and it has, has a lot of arguments about you know, past military episodes. And curiously, all of those episodes can be found in the Tongdian. And it, it looks as if whoever wrote uh, the questions and replies um, was using the Tongdian as a reference. Yeah, that's very interesting. I mean, it'd be much easier than trying to go dig up all the original materials. And it's, it is suspicious if like what their, all their examples are like in a direct list in the Tongdian, so yeah. 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 It's, it's just a little bit too neat. Yeah. So if, if, if I, <laughs> for, for me to think the um, questions and replies really reliable, there would have to be material in there that I would be surprised. By. I wouldn't know where it's coming from. You know, and, and, and they're always stories I already know from elsewhere. There's not, and, and if it's these, you know, two guys, the emperor and his general, who you know cooperated closely through their careers and had this, um, they'd be referring to episodes that I would not know anything about. You would not know anything about. Um, most experts would not know about. Yeah, exactly. It, it, it's it's just just too neat, too clean, kind of too cut and dried. Yeah. So the so part of the importance of Li Jing's work is that it's more verifiably from the early seventh century and therefore serves as a good uh, counterpart to the strategicon, right? Yes. And uh, so the next kind of question I have is if we have the, um, how do we, you've talked a little bit about how we place Li Jing's text in its broader context. Um, and you might speak on that a little more, but I also have the question about the Byzantine work and how, what is its historical context? How do we compare these two things and are they rising out of similar places or is it different um, needs creating similar results? Mm, or it, it's a, a similar needs creating similar results. Okay, yeah, yeah, exactly. Where, where, yeah, that's uh, probably what it is. So I would just I really end up, but um, it, certainly here we have um, two kind of old empires, right? The Tang is the heir to the Sui most directly. But of course, the Sui is a reunification that's you know, attempting to you know, rebuild the glories of uh, the Han Dynasty. So there's really a, um, an imperial tradition going back to uh, uh, Qin and Han. And it, you know, gets kind of complicated in the period of division. Yeah, yeah, uh, we all have but, to talk about all that right now. <laughs> right. But there's a lot there. Yeah, that, that will take a long time. But um, that that imperial legacy was 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 never forgotten, and the regimes both north and south during the period of, of division, you know, tried to you know, run according to a more or less a Han model. Yeah. Um, so you have that, that really ancient uh, tradition of statecraft and administration. And in Byzantium, you have something you know, very, very similar that the Byzantium is with it's, the, it's what's left of the Roman Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire. And um, there was no regime change there. You know, the empire just continued in the East. So it's heir to, to all of the uh, corpus of Greek literature, of uh, Roman literature, of um, heir to, to um, Roman traditions of administration. So um, they have a lot in common there and a way of kind of thinking 
um, about um, security problems very coolly and rationally. It's not um, uh, war and conflict are not a place to kind of show off one's uh, manhood or prove one's social status, as in a lot of other um, cultures of the, of the period. Yeah, uh, it's it's really about uh, the survival of the state. Yeah. So yes, this gets into um, kind of the some of the meat of the argument, and uh, yeah. So my next question is. What is a way of warfare and what is a Western way of warfare and an Eastern way of warfare? <laughs> okay, yeah. This, so you can uh, take a few minutes to unpack all these. That's a big question. Okay, yeah. <laughs> totally. My since starting point in the book is kind of taking issue you know, with the notion of a, a Western way of war. And this idea was really promoted above all by the classicist uh, Victor Davis Hansen. Um, in a, a series of books published since about 1990. And the notion has also been embraced by other prominent uh, military historians such as uh, Jeffrey Parker and, and John Keegan. So is this, uh, so is the, the idea of the Western way of warfare, uh, would you say it's still very strong, a very strong sentiment among many uh, military historians today that are not studying uh, East um, Asia. It it um is it's, like it's still out there, yeah. and uh, and 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 still has a, a certain influence. It's been yeah. you know, used as the basis for some of the uh, curriculum at um, U.S. military schools, for example. Uh, yeah. The, so uh, what uh, what in the um, traditional argument, uh, what is the traditional argument for the Western way of warfare? What is the Western way of warfare, according to Hansen? The uh, notion that uh, really ever since the time of um, classical Greece, so we're really talking kind of the fifth century BC, you know, yeah. the time of the, the Persian Wars, and then going from there into the Peloponnesian Wars, that uh, the um, you know, Greeks um, really pioneered a mode of combat that remained uh, a, an approach to conflict that has remained typical of the West, however you want to define that, yes. ever since. Oh, ever elusive concept. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this notion of um, you want to um, fight directly, you want to settle the matter quickly um, with, the, this is Hansen's uh, term, the hammer blows of shock combat. Um, you don't like missile weapons. You don't like any sort of standoffishness or indirection. Um, and um, you know, trickery is frowned upon too. So it's this, yeah. kind of bare, and so that, that's really the core of the notion. Is, is you know yeah, settle so, things quickly in a manly way you know frontally you know face to face um, no stratagems or anything and um, and of course all sorts of uh, criticisms have been raised about the concept and you know whether it actually applies very well to ancient Greece with all, all we know about say the um, Athenians generally bending over backwards to avoid uh, land combat for much of the Peloponnesian War. And that's the Pericles whole strategy. It's yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was actually just going to ask, like, how much, do, how much does this actually apply to ancient right. Greece itself, right? Right, and then we move on to Rome and the uh, Punic Wars, the Second Punic War, we encounter, you know, Fabius the Delayer, right, who yeah. <laughs> approached the problem of, of Hannibal is, you know, not to fight him for a while, you know, to, yeah. Wait well, for and, not just a while, a very long time. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, then you move on to the Middle Ages, and you know, for much of that period, you know, it's uh, most there aren't a whole lot of major battles. That most fighting is skirmishes, raids, um, sieges. And it, it revolves around the avoidance of battle rather than than battle seeking behavior. Um, so, you know, there are all sorts of problems with even applying this notion to the, to the West, <laughs> but, um, uh, Hansen and some, especially, uh, scholars who have agreed with him, like, uh, John Keegan, for example, um, then, so, uh, uh, 
applied sort of the opposite of the notion of uh, the Western way of war to the East. And sometimes they would call it Asian warfare, sometimes Oriental, sometimes just primitive warfare, but it involves everything the Western way of war is not. So you, you are standoffish, you use trickery, you use missile weapons, and deception, and, um, and uh, so that's you know, supposed to be the uh, way that Orientals operate in war. Yeah. And of course you can find by pulling selected passages out of Sun Tzu's Art of War, you can present what looks like evidence in support of that. Yeah, well, the thing is, I mean, many of the things that you list, such as deception and use of missile weapons, are just good practice in all manner of warfare generally. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. But so, uh, so the. And in fact, I ran across some articles by experts on ancient Greek warfare just listing all of the episodes in ancient Greece where trickery was used. <laughs> And it's quite a long list. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's kind of crucial you don't part of warfare. To, you don't even have to go all the way back and include the Trojan horse. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So the kind of to sum up the idea of the Western way of warfare is this idea of, you know, you stand up face to face like a man, you man up and you just face them directly and just, you know, punch each other out. Yep, so uh, strength against strength, get it over with quickly. Yeah, it's just, yeah. just you know, the, the fight club yeah. boxing match. You know? Yeah, okay. And then the contrast of the Eastern way would be you elude your opponent and you, uh, like in the very Sun Tzu manner, you strike where they're weak and uh, avoid where they're strong. <laughs> you never mm -hmm. face them directly. You always exploit it, exploiting the situation and so. deceive them to the greatest extent possible. Yeah, okay. And these are the two mm -hmm. models that have been constructed for Eastern and Western warfare. Yeah. Um, so what do we learn about these models when we examine the Strategicon and Beijing's Art of War? Yeah, we find that the uh, Byzantines, who are defined by Hansen as, as part of the West, and it, it's really hard not to, you know, given their, their lineage from Rome, yeah, their lineage, that, uh, that, that, that what they're doing is in practice is, is really not significantly different from, from what uh, the, uh, the Tong, early Tang Chinese are doing. Um, that, and what they're actually doing is really in between these two ideal types. Yeah. So we find, you know, Chinese armies being a, a lot of what Li Jing says, you know, speaks to this point of, um, of it, it's about, you know, drilling troops, you know, to fight in close order formation on foot in a you know, stand up battle. So it, it's, it's not hit and run. It's not ambush. It's, you know, they're, they're being they're trained to you know, fight in formation as in, in, in frontal combat against um, as, as disciplined infantry. Yeah, yeah. So uh, this gets into, um, yeah, it's kind of the way, well, one of the good ways that you kind of argue against these models is to show that, you know, Tong China is doing things that people would say exist in the Western model and Byzantium is doing things that would exist in the Eastern model, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So, and, and the, Byzantines are making an awful lot of use of kind of cavalry, raiding, skirmishes, um, deception of the opponent, um, using kind of ca cavalry against the, the opponent's kind of flank and rear, trying to conceal, you know, surprise cavalry units outside of the opponent's field of vision, and um, that there's an awful lot of that. Yeah. And it's, it's not that the Chinese, the Tang Chinese weren't doing this. It's just that the, the Byzantines are doing an awful lot of it. And the, yeah. uh, um, and the, the formula says they shouldn't. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Uh, um, so this actually gets into something I really wanted to, um, well, first, can you, we go over some examples of uh, some ways that the, organization or the equipment and the tactics of the Tang and Byzantium are very similar. 
So those are three different categories. We can take our turn with each one. Or, so. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Certainly the, the um, you know, basic kind of range of kind of weapons and uh, equipment. I mean, th there are really no radical differences in, in land warfare. Um, they, if you, you look at the, the um, armor, in both, both cases, they're making, re relying mainly on kind of lamellar types of armor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, say ra rather than kind of plate or chain mail. Um, and uh, they're both fielding a mixture of infantry and cavalry. Uh, the cavalry um, is of is there a range of types, but ranging from really step type, you know, very light, you know, cavalry with kind of unarmored horses who are, you know, fighting, you know, only, you know, very lightly armored uh, horsemen who are fighting primarily as archers, you know, using uh, composite bows. And they also have a, a heavier uh, cavalry, you know, where the, um, the rider is wearing more armor than you know, it seen the light cavalry and the horses themselves are armored. Yeah, the cataphracts. Yeah, the cataphract type cavalry. And, you know, yeah. But so, both, um, both the Chinese and uh, the Byzantines have you know, both types of cavalry, you know, plus infantry. The infantry uh, relies you know, very heavily on spears mainly, but they also have, um, you know, missile weapons, also bows in the carried by infantrymen. And um, they also have uh, crossbows in, in both forces. Although the, so, the Chinese make more use of it than the, of those than the Byzantines. Yes, yeah. So yeah, I was gonna ask you about the crossbows. So um, yeah, cause a lot of the crossbow in many ways is a very, uh, it's uh, somewhat quintessential in lots of Chinese warfare. Mm. Um, yeah. And uh, I think by Tang times, uh, the, the crossbow was less central than it had been for Han, as it was a you know, standard infantry weapon in, in Han. Um, and by uh, Tang times, it was a weapon used by relatively small units of specialists you know, who could you know, still make, make a, a, a real difference in in battle, there's an account from the Anlushan Rebellion in the, the 750s of a, a crossbow unit actually um, you know, holding um, the rebel cavalry at bay with, with uh, continuous volley fire. So they had the crossbowmen broken down into a number of sections. So uh, one group was firing, another was, was uh, different, other groups were in various stages of reloading. Yeah, yeah. That um volley fire lots of historians have spent, have spent a lot of ink talking about the volley fire right. Right. <laughs> and it, 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 it's, it's not just an early modern do it's, it, it's not yeah. just a european development it's not just an early modern development yeah yeah and, and in in china i would argue that it antedates the song too yeah yeah it goes back you can find evidence in Tom. yeah um so Another question I kind of wanted to ask related to some of these details is the role of infantry in the Tang military and in just medieval China in general. So infantry is frequently not discussed as much, even though it's kind of the backbone of most armies. Yeah. So yeah. can you come up or can you uh, provide some examples and talk a little bit about the importance of infantry in this period? Yes, I mean, the, the infantry was indeed the, the, the backbone of Tang armies, even in the early Tang. And, um, and that this is in part um, due to the fact just that um, it's easier to train infantry, easier to equip them. Um, and uh, the um, a Tang state was often kind of limited by the number of horses at its, at its disposal. So, um, so we find that um, certainly Chinese 
armies of uh, the period seem to have been composed um, with of, primarily of infantry, in, infantry as 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 the majority of of the force, and I think a fairly you know typical proportion would be three quarters or more infantry. Okay, yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, yeah. and primarily yeah. would be shield and spear. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the 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 role of infantry. Do you? Uh, there's a transition that's been talked about in some scholarship about uh, the where these troops came from. Were they hereditary military families or something else? And what's the role of conscription? And all these types of things yeah. in the organization of these armies. So yeah. where where do these infantry come from, kind of? Yeah, and I mean the, the um, early Tang armies are coming from from multiple sources, and uh, one source is the the so called uh, Fu Bing, which is you know, soldiers of the headquarters. It's a um, um, system of you know locally based um, military administrative units, really, yeah. not not tactical or operational units that are kind of distributed around the empire. This institution has its kind of origins back in the, the Northern dynasties, you know, before the uh, Sway uh, unification, reunification. Um, and uh, these are really not exactly professional soldiers in the modern sense, but they are just about the closest that, you know, Tong had, apart from palace guard units in, in early Tong, that uh, these um, men brought into the Fubing would then you know, serve for really their adult lives there until they reached old age. Um, and they wouldn't be constantly on active duty, but they would be uh, called up periodically. There were kind of regular rotation schedules for doing guard duty in the capital or on the frontier. And in addition, kind of men could be called up for service in an expeditionary army. So a, once um, enrolled as a Fu Bing, a, a man could expect to you know, see um, active duty you know, repeatedly during the course of his life, probably every, every few years, certainly his, at the very least, his you know, turn would, would come up again. Yeah, so it's something like, um, say, comparable to a modern National Guard system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty similar. And then when they first enrolled, do they go through kind of a training process? Do we know much about that? Um, we, we, there are some descriptions of, um, of and practice with, with the bow, with other, other uh, weapons of, um, you know, being expected to chant or sing songs as part of their training of their accounts of um, units being brought together for that's first an individual training at home and then units being you know, brought together for you know group training um, during the agricultural slack season each year all right so yes talking about the full being is very interesting um it, it the parallels to the national guard are also uh very interesting i know that um yeah, they would go training, they would undergo the training, and then they could be deployed for, you know, campaigns or for border service or to guard the capital. Um, but eventually, we also have new systems that arise, such as the GR. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what happens with the full being system and how do things change with Tong infantry soldiers? Sure. Yeah. And the first point to make is that the, the Fu Bing alone were not sufficient to meet all the of the empire's military needs. I mean, that was had been true of Sui before Tong. It was true of the, the early Tong also that uh, they, you know, to really fill out armies for kind of large expeditions, especially they had to turn to conscription to to kind of raise, um, you know, short term conscripts. Yeah, it, it, the um, Tong. A record they're they're generally called Bing Mu. Mm. And uh, um, so armies were assembled from a variety of sources, Fu Bing, Bing Mu, you would also have uh, maybe small numbers of gen gentlemen volunteers, so righteous, <laughs> who were called righteous campaigners. Um, 
Yi Zheng, um, especially if the emperor himself was leading the campaign. You know, the, these were again, members of local elites who wanted to catch the emperor's eye and get noticed. Get yeah. And they would also bring their retinue, which uh, could be a lot of extra troops. <laughs> right. Right. So, and so kind of going back to one of your uh, question you asked earlier about, you know, what's, what's the background of these people? Uh, to what extent is this hereditary? And I would have to say for the time, we, we don't absolutely know for sure. And there, in the Fu Bing, there was probably a hereditary element, but it was not universal. But if we look at um, the, the, some areas of uh, Northwestern China, especially around Chang'an, in Guangzhou that had kind of large numbers of um, military headquarters there, large numbers of Fu. We've, you know, almost every registered adult male was a soldier. That was the, the <laughs> so that was the only way they could field, you know, that many troops and maintain that many units. So, um, so there was just necessarily hereditary. Yeah, yeah. Not, not because the plan was that, that you know, his son shall follow father. That was just the way it worked out to get to get the numbers they needed. And I think the hereditary element was probably much less prominent in, in the Bing rule. It was kind of luck of the draw, kind of hit or miss there. Yeah. Did she, yeah, whether or not they get called up for service. Yeah. Yeah. But um, so how do we get from there to the Gen R? The, which I, I translate as as sturdy lads, yeah. <laughs> um, and it's that the perhaps the problem with the the Fu Bing is that they're very well suited for um, and the Bing Mu too. Who are, so they're they're well suited for a short campaign that's over quickly. You march out with the expeditionary army, locate the enemy, defeat them decisively. You know, march home, have your triumph in the capital and go back to your farm. And, um, and in the early Tang, that was working fairly well when they were fighting kind of civil wars or uh, fighting against um, opponents close to the Chinese borders that they were you know, fortunate enough, enough to be able to knock out expeditiously. And they, yeah. um, and get lands really a, a couple of decisive blows, like the the um, fighting, say, the Eastern Turks in uh, 630. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the problem came uh, later in the uh, 7th century, when um, armies had to be deployed and kept in the field for a long time. And this problem was seen when the Tang were trying to subdue the um, uh, Kugoryo and Pakche in the, the Korean Peninsula. Um, you know, troops had to be kept there year after year after year. And also it was seen in deployments against the Tibetans and um, against uh, the uh, revived Eastern uh, Turk Empire from the, the late uh, 670s on. So, um, so you couldn't just send the troops out and um, win a battle and bring them home again. It was again, necessary for expeditionary armies to settle down in place on the frontier and confront the Tibetans. And uh, that made uh, military service much less attractive. Yeah, yeah. You couldn't go back to your, your farm or your family for year after year. And um, so uh, the government then, the Tang government sought for means to kind of maintain these armies while um, keeping morale good. And they, they found that a certain percentage of soldiers were kind of willing to stay on the frontier for extra pay, extra compensation. And um, then they were kind of encouraged to find wives there or bring their families to the frontier and settle down. So this sort of more um, permanent sort of professional soldier living in a frontier community with, with his family there in the frontier community then became the norm. And this, this was a you know, gradual process that took um, more than half a century to really 
become fully developed. So we see the kind of beginnings of this process um, in the late 670s, really. And it um, is, is not complete until the 730s mm -hmm. that we see these, the armies stationed along the frontier have come to be you know, composed of really long service kind of professional soldiers who don't have their roots in the interior of the empire anymore. Their roots are now in, in, in frontier communities. And of course, the, these are the uh, you know, soldiers. These are, it's this sort of soldier that uh, An Lushan led into rebellion at the end mm -hmm. of 75. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, okay, now that was, uh, yeah, that was a lot of good information there about the uh, infantry of the Tang Dynasty. Um, now, I want to take another, take a step back a little bit and go back to Byzantium and talk a little bit about, um, there's one major thread that you think connects these two uh, old uh, powerful states on two sides of this continent and what is this common thread and how do both of these states find similar uh, solutions to the, this problem yeah and yeah the, the so the question that I was really trying to answer here in, in the Eurasian way of war beyond you know just um pointing out the similarities between Tang and Byzantium and how that's kind of undercuts the notion of a Western way of war or an Oriental way of war, then there's the question of, well, why are they so similar? Mm -hmm. what, you know, apart from being old bureaucratic empires, you know, what else is going on here? And, and what I found to just you know, dominate uh, the concerns of military writers on both sides is uh, the Eurasian steppe and steppe nomad opponents. That for both empires, you know, this was really the, the single largest security concern. Um, yeah, so yeah, that's exactly um, what I was teasing at. Uh, they're <laughs> hinting yeah. at is like, yes the, the both of that. these both of these large empires bordering the steppe um the steppe has could you speak a little bit about what features of the steppe made it into the threat that it was why yeah. was the steppe the central threat the steppe populations are not all that large you know, compared to the sedentary populations, but the lifestyle is such that just about every um, able-bodied adult male can be a warrior. So um, their, you'd say their day-to-day -day way of life um, is not all that different from their mode of warfare, their campaigning style. It yeah. Would, so, so, um, so in, um, you know, steppe nomad groups, I mean, they, they're they not just able to put almost every man into the field, but almost every man into the saddle. So they're all they're just, just overwhelmingly cavalry, yeah. highly mobile. Um, and as long as they've got grassland, they can move through, right? Logistics is not a problem because they're bringing their herds along with them or just extra horses. And you, you kill a sheep, you can kill, you, you, or you can feed X number of men with that. Yeah, yeah. You kill a horse, you know, your extra horses, you can feed yourself and, and quite a few of your friends. Yeah, exactly. And I think um, many people that I know who study, you know, um, like medieval English or French history, I don't think they always grasp the amount of horses and that we're dealing with with these uh, steppe armies and what it's the what it's like when the logistics become so fluid and ingrained in just the, the daily life of nomadic people. So, yeah, yeah. and this really the, the 
logistical aspect here of where these you know, steppe armies you know, could and could not go you know, with their horses and sheep and things. Um, it really um, could dictated the success or failure of particular campaigns. And an awful lot of work has been done on the um, Mongol invasion of Syria around 1260 in, in particular, that that's kind of a fairly well kind of documented case where you know, if you know, the Mongols would have done a lot better had there been more brass and conditions less hot and dry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. The Mongols, they don't have any problem with winter, but they have a problem with the heat more than the, the cold. It's very interesting. They complain about it and when they go to like Vietnam and stuff too. <laughs> but... so, so the the nomads then, both east and west, both in the, in the Mongolian steppes and uh, the um, the um, kind of western steppes, yeah, much of yeah, including what's now Ukraine. Yeah, um, the nomads are you know very similar. They're they're warlike, numerous, highly mobile cavalry, mounted archers, and you know they're very good at certain sorts of tactics of of the. A you know, surprise raid, they strike, they retreat, they lure their sedentary opponent after them and very often into an ambush. They pretend to flee and then yeah. turn on their pursuers because of their, their, their um, mobility, their horsemanship kind of makes this very easy for them. And they ride circles around the sedentary armies that are opposing them because the you know, sedentary army whether Byzantine or Chinese, is only partly cavalry. It's bringing a lot of infantry and carrying, dragging along a lot of baggage. So much slower. So, um, so the sedentary power, east or west, you know, faces the same sort of opponent and the same sorts of strategic operational tactical problems. Yeah, and you, the, these nomad armies, you know, you're not always able to track everything going on out there on the step. You don't know when exactly they're going to show up or where they're going to show up. Yeah. So you have to be ready to respond to this right. potentially so, large invasion that could happen overnight, seemingly. Yeah, so, so in both Chinese and Byzantine texts, there is really obsessiveness about scouting and patrols. Yeah. You, know, you you always you know want to make sure you have, you have the scouts out around your camp, kind of the pickets. You want to um, make sure you're sending patrols out to a considerable distance. So, yeah, so especially to too because they also would campaign and go out into the step too yeah. to meet their adversary. So when you go into the nomads area, you really have to really be careful and have that uh, peak situational awareness. So. Right. Both the Tang and the Byzantine military authors are, you know, give give very similar advice. You know, when when you see the the opponent, the step opponent retreating or fleeing, you know, don't pursue them. Just or, don't chase really, them. Yeah, just hold on to chase, what you have. Don't, don't, yeah. don't, don't jump to conclusions. You know, look at it carefully. You know, don't break ranks. If you're going to move forward, do it in you know, formation, kind of slowly. Yeah, be very methodical because the thing some lay people don't understand about pre-modern warfare is that the retreat is when you actually win and decisively beat your opponent. Right, right. It, it, it's, it's when the opponent you know, turns their back that they're vulnerable. Yeah. That, that's when the opportunity arises to um, turn a fight where the casualties have been approximately even on the two sides into something that's just, you know, has just a really lopsided you know, kill ratio in favor of the victors. Yeah, yeah. So um, there's a couple other questions about this. Um, how successful were these respective states in exerting power into the step or countering power from the step? Okay, I'm, I, I would uh, argue that, that they were um, both reasonably successful. I would say that the, the, the early Tang achieved the most spectacular successes. Yeah. 
don't think I, I can't think of a Byzantine equivalent of you know Tang Taizong really taking out you know the first Eastern Turk Empire. That, yeah. Uh, and you know, ca capturing their Khan and and all of that. It's yeah, it's a very then getting those tribes then on board and yeah, then having them for decades thereafter as auxiliaries that, that he could call on for his own army to launch campaigns to subdue uh, you know Turkic groups farther west. Yeah, yeah, that's a uh, huge uh, success on the part of Tong Tai Tsong. And uh, just a very interesting individual in history in general. Yeah, um, yeah the, but the ability to defeat the Turks and then also then recruit the Turks to your side all in kind of one move. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Extremely powerful. Um, do we, how uh, sometimes some of the sources in Chinese history are not always uh, don't always give us the best details about how some of these things worked or happened. Um, but uh, I do wonder what what role does um, ethnic identity play in these this uh, the Tang Dynasty success in this manner? And because the Tang Dynasty is generally attributed to be a Chinese dynasty, and it certainly is. Uh, a dynasty of the central plains, but it is also a dynasty of many other plains, many other places. Yes. So, so how do, how do we really classify the Tang Dynasty? And um, yeah, well, the the you could think of the the Tang as really the the last and most successful of the northern dynasties, coming out of, of that 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 period of of division, and of course the. The uh, if you retrace the lineage here, right? The um, Sui Dynasty had its origin in the Northern Zhou. It basically emerged as the the kind of result of a kind of coup d'état with at the mm -hmm. at the uh, the Northern Zhou court. You know, the Northern Zhou's roots are then out of in, in the breakup of the Northern Way of the the Tuoba Way or the Tabgach yeah. Way. So. Um, and of course, the so the the Tang leadership group really emerged from the Sui leadership group, which emerged from the Zhou leadership group, which emerged from the Wei. So, and and of course, the the Wei leadership originated on the steppe. Yeah, they they started out in the Dai region of what's what's now northern Shanxi around around you know today's Datong. Mm -hmm. Um, and and then you know conquered North China from there. So where I'm getting at with this is that really the the Tang elite, really the, the top elite that founded you know the Tang Dynasty, um, like their Sui precursors and Northern Zhou precursors, um, were of really mixed origin, you know, steppe and and Han Chinese. And if you, you look at the, the ancestry of Tang Taizong, you'll see a whole lot of non-Chinese surnames, especially on the, the, the female side. <laughs> yeah, his mother's side, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we have, uh, and I think that a lot of people sometimes get hung up on the um, ethnic or genetic lineage of some of the Tang's early rulers. Um, but I think that what's arguably more important is the cultural understanding that right. meant with that many of these elites had where they were able to bridge and communicate across both worlds exactly uh, that that um so the lee sherman and other members of his family and of, of that kind of founding leadership group of tom really were you know, brought up in a frontier environment you know they had really a dual heritage culturally you know, part Han Chinese and, um, you know, part, you know, the steppe nomad chieftain. And so Tang Taizong himself was, you know, perfectly literate in, um, in Chinese. Um, he wrote a treatise on government right, as emperor, arguing that you've got to balance the civil and the military. That was his main thesis to have the state running properly. 
he wrote poetry. He had command poetry performances for his ministers. Yeah. And set the theme and everything. And then they, they'd have a time limit to produce poems. Um, That's no pressure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Stephen Owen at Harvard uh, once described it as, as being like, um, imagine Arnold Schwarzenegger in a tuxedo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, but he was, he was also a, you know, a, a fierce warrior, is a, a great, great archer, swordsman, and um, you know, fought um, up front and you know, personal in his battles. And he you know, claimed to have you know, killed um, or personally accounted more th for more than a thousand opponents in battle. Well, a big claim. <laughs> <laughs> In one battle, it's said that he, he fought until his sleeves were you know, filled with blood. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, this, um, this brings us to another interesting point. Uh, do we know, I'm not as well versed in Byzantine history, uh, do we know, were the Byzantine elites also able to communicate with the steppe in the same manner? Or is this something, an advantage that the Tong had that could explain some of their success in the early Tong period? Yeah. Um, my sense is that the uh, latter is, is the more, more correct explanation that that the um that you know certainly there were uh, diplomatic um marriages done by the by byzantine rulers um but um there there wasn't kind of the same level of you say cultural you know dual inheritance there that we, we see in, in the Tong case. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the Byzantine rulers by and large were really coming out of the kind of Greek and kind of Roman tradition and not so much influenced personally by steppe traditions. They were certainly aware of, say, steppe tactics and the need to counter them or of uh, step technology and the need to adopt it. You know, for example, stirrups, which uh, yeah. I think they're, they're a, a good case can be made that the kind of vector of transmission for the earliest stirrups from North Asia, you know, north of, of China to um, yeah. the Western steppes is, is, is the, the Avars. Yes, yes. Uh, I was gonna bring that up at some point. Um, yeah, so this yeah, gets us into technology. And uh, another interesting uh, case that you explore in your book um, is the traction trebuchet. So the uh, counterweight trebuchet is, I think, fairly conclusively agreed that the counterweight trebuchet, the one with the big weight that has the stones that help throw the, throw the projectile, that was most likely brought by the Mongols into fight against Song China, particularly this heat of Xiangyang is very famous. Right. Um, even though people always look overlook the Navy, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. But, <laughs> um, but the, the traction trebuchet is a trebuchet for those who don't know where you have uh, a, a bunch of ropes and rather than using a weight to throw the projectile, you have a bunch of men pool all at the same time and it you know launches a projectile so and this is something that existed in china a very long time ago it's all the way back in what's uh, yeah so it goes back to easily to the the warring states period yeah. yeah so we know that china obviously had this and it eventually appears in the west was it brought by the avars what do we think and yeah um it's possible to make a case because it's it's seen um in East Asia first, and then it turns up in, in, in Europe, Eastern Europe, and, and the kind of Balkans kind of north of the, the northern edges of the Byzantine Empire, and like being used in sieges in which the Avars are involved. Um, so again, one can't really trace it, you know, step by step across the steps, you'd say, from archaeological site to archaeological site. Um, but um, certainly th there is kind of a, just the timing of this kind of where 
it appears and you know, who is using it. Um, it creates a, a, an interesting you know, circumstantial case or mm -hmm. it, it's being part of a package of military technology that's moving from east to west in this early medieval period. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and yeah, as uh, many historians know, you don't always get clear answers. Sometimes you're left with lots of ambiguity. Um, so yeah, certainly very possible that Avars could have done it. And you said that the case for the stirrup is stronger. We have more evidence for that or more agreement on that. Um, yeah, but we don't have uh, many sieges all through the steppe leading all the way from Chang'an to <laughs> uh, Constantinople. <laughs> so, um, yeah, yeah. so just exactly who the Avars who turned up uh, north of the Byzantine Empire were and how they got there is also murky. Yes, uh, and we're not even uh, going to talk about the Huns, no. <laughs> so the, the way that these, uh, the steppe peoples move, the way that they identify themselves and how, when they move and how groups form and all this is extremely complex. Um, it's not easy to just point at books in one part of the world and books in another part of the world and say these people are, are the same. They might be connected. It's difficult to actually prove and find out how they're connected, so. Yes. Yeah. Um, my next question is about the Tibetans. So the Tibetans seem to me like something that's uh, fairly unique to uh, a unique challenge uh, posed against Tong China um, that is a little different than many what the Byzantines would have faced or what the Turks, the Eastern Turks were in China. Um, so what is, um, we know that China would, you know, fight the Turks and Byzantium would fight Avars and other steppe peoples. Uh, but what element did the Tibetans bring to this whole equation? And yeah, how did, how does things work with that? So. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, a, a Tibet was, was a, a problem in uh, part because of the difficulty of getting up there to fight them. Yeah. There homeland just because of the geography was was inaccessible it was was um, really not a uh, vulnerable to to tong attack um, but say the tibetans could kind of descend down fairly easily into areas that were of great strategic importance to to the tong yeah all those this mountain passes <laughs> yeah so th this includes areas immediately to the uh, west of the capital Chang'an. It includes the borderlands of Sichuan, uh, west of, of Chengdu. Um, it would also include the Gansu Corridor. You know, the the um, and the the Tang uh, connection to the Silk Road and, and Central Asia. Yeah, so those the lucrative Silk Roads. You horrible. cannot yeah. have the money supply cut off by right. Tibetan right. Yeah. control of the region. So yeah, and. Uh, Tibet was uh, dangerous too, as a sort of a, a, a hybrid state that had both infantry and cavalry, and that was was um, not not simply a sort of tribal grouping, but something that was had, had by the mid seventh century become kind of well organized as an empire. Um, so. Uh, the Tibetans uh, could, for example, were, were better prepared to do things that uh, typical steppe nomads have difficulty with, like conduct sieges. And a lot of the borderland fighting against the uh, Tibetans in the uh, late uh, 7th century and early 8th century um, revolved around siege, siege warfare. Yeah, so that poses a unique kind of threat to Tong China, particularly in those border regions. Um, now, uh, Li Jing uh, isn't talking about this directly as much because the Tibetans were not the enemy of his day. Right, uh, right. It's so Tibetans, it, it's really just a, a few years after his death. Yeah, the, yeah. That's so a, a big security threat. And yeah, so. So what, um, in what ways do the, um, 
is there a, a shift in grand strategy because of the Tibetans or do the similar tactics and the emphasis against steppe armies still continue uh, throughout the Tang period? Hmm. Yeah, that 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 is perhaps the the, the, the toughest question you've asked. So, right? and one one that I really have to stop and think about for a moment. And um, yeah, I, so the, the the fighting the the you know, Tibetans is not exactly the same as fighting against step powers, but it's not completely different either. Yeah. So they, um, that uh, certainly that that some of the, the same tactics that could be used by steppe forces could also be used by by the the Tibetans, mm -hmm. and I think the uh, Tibetans where they, they they differed I would say is that they they had much more of an interest than the typical steppe power in actually taking territory and holding that and. You know, coloring territory on the map, their color. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, the um, steppe powers, really going all the way back to the Eastern Turks at the end of, of Sway, beginning of Tom, and then you know continuing on through the the, the Second Turk Empire, the uh, uh, the Khitan, and uh, the uh, the Uyghurs. Um, there interest is not really in conquering China or really any really significant part of northern China you know what what they want to do is is dominate and extract tribute yeah you don't need to conquer China and run it you just need to get all the money and the good yeah, stuff yeah. Like, so, so, <laughs> so the, 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 the game say in the very early late sway early top very early time before 630 was really the the um Eastern Turks were trying to um, play off different Chinese contenders against each other and get them all to kind of acknowledge the, the supremacy of the Turks. Yeah. So and that, that, was, that was the game there, to keep, keep China divided and, uh, and no ruler in China in a position to say no to the Kagan. Yeah, so they would extract that wealth uh, but the Tibetans had different strategies, as you mentioned, they wanted to control those key choke points on trade routes and key uh, fertile land, like in Sichuan. Um, yeah, and they took it, certainly took advantage of uh, Tang China's being distracted by the An Lushan Rebellion to you know, push, push their border um, way to the east and kind of much closer to Chang'an. And back yeah. for it brief period late in uh, in 763 they actually occupied china and put a um, uh, they found a member of the the tang imperial family to you know, put on the throne as a, a puppet ever so briefly yeah. and uh, then among other things that they, they were forced out you know not just by the maneuvering of tang armies under guo zi and their own overextension but also by um severe rainstorms that they were apparently up, up to their knees in water and according to you know, some accounts in the Tang histories that that, that 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 was the last straw for for the tibetans that they yeah yeah this, the rain the, the weather here is just too disgusting we want to go home. yeah it's <laughs> yeah they need a frozen Altitude, al <laughs> alpine they, climate. They, they, want, they, they want that alpine desert. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. So uh, kind of wrapping up here, I want to get to um, some more, some broader questions about military history in general and the field itself. And what, um, what impact do you think your book has made or that might be uh, a big question or one that you might not feel as comfortable talking about, but is there any, do you, do you see changes in the way that people are perceiving military history and the Western and Eastern way of warfare as they were uh, conceptualized in the nineties and before? So. Okay, I mean, I, this, this is, is really hard for me to, to judge. Um, 
that I, I have seen, um, certainly I, I've uh, corresponded with several uh, scholars who have, um, over the last few years, who have, um, so I complained, uh, voiced concerns or ob objections to the no notion of a Western way of war and were um, kind of looking for refutations of it. And um, I think I've been told that they found mine to be one of the most satisfying. So it's, nice. it's not the only one that, that's a number of other scholars have attacked it from various directions, I think before me, perhaps the, the most effective, before my work, the most effective was perhaps John Lynn's book, A Battle. Um, so I think it, it's had some impact. It's been mentioned also by Stephen Murillo in his I think, work, Introduction to Military History, What is Military History? Um, highlights kind of a couple of, of ongoing debates. And, and one of them is the, um, military revolution and the other is the notion of a <clears throat> the western way of war versus other ways of war and i think uh, uh, professor Murillo is i think more inclined to think that the military revolution debate is more fruitful and that uh, <laughs> <laughs> that uh, uh, the argument over a western way of war is is um, maybe a dead end yeah uh, or, or that maybe the the whole notion doesn't merit all the ink that's been spilled on it. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but still, he he gives my work some attention. It's uh, mm -hmm. the impression he sees sees it as a as a positive development in that particular debate. Yeah, yeah. I have to say personally, I very much enjoyed the book. I think that um, uh, academia is not always uh, does not always work in tandem with popular culture. So I see that even though uh, in academia, some uh, scholars are much more hesitant to defend the notion of the Western way of war, it very much still kind of exists in popular culture. Right. And that will just take time and more, uh, more comparative studies or more just uh, critiques or, um, yeah. you know, discursive analysis of what Western way of war really means. Um, yeah, I think that there's, um, but I do think that, uh, the currents are shifting, uh, maybe not as fast as we'd like, but, uh, now, uh, but my next question is what role do you think, um, military history is not always considered the most, um, prestigious or important of fields of history. Um, <laughs> yeah, that doesn't, doesn't get a lot of respect. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't always get a lot of respect, right? Um, and, but uh, since, you know, the cultural turn and things and the shift into Chinese military history, uh, I think that um, that has brought a lot of new ideas into military history in general. Um, do you, what role do you see for a military history at, with other historical you know, focuses? And uh, what role in particular do you see mili Chinese military history playing? Yeah, well, I certainly think that there's a lot more that can be done with military history in connection though with, with, with other um, areas of historical inquiry. And this is one, one of the great things about military history is you can pair it with just about anything else. Mm. And um, it is, is instructive and, and, and informative. And I see one area of um, uh, development in particular that I think is, is extremely promising is um, so the interface between uh, military history and environmental history or even climate history. Yes, I know that uh, the Cosmo comes to mind. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm actually just, just back from a workshop at the Institute for Advanced Study uh, okay. organized, uh, that is uh, looking at uh, the um, 
influence of uh, climate and climate change on Chinese history going all the way back to the Tang Dynasty. Yes, yes, okay, yeah, because there's supposed to be, there's a, a cooling period, if I remember, during the, around the mid Tang, right? Yes. Okay, yes, yeah. Yes, and, and uh, we're very interested in questions like, did that have anything to do with the outbreak of, or did that have an influence on the outbreak of the Anoshan Rebellion? Yeah, yeah, is there a connection? Yeah, because it would greatly impact, you know, food security, right. and many other things. Right, uh, so it could conceivably have brought um, you know, conditions on the step, have brought um, more uh, tribal types in from the step to the army camps and you know, forts along the border, who were then kind of recruits for An Lushan's military machine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. So um, last kind of uh, question, is there anything that you wish more people knew about your field and what you study just in general? Because this just goes out to, you know, the internet. So is there a declaration you wish to make or just some word of advice or, you know, insight into history? Okay, the same. I'm probably... Um preaching to the converted for anyone who would be choosing to to watch you to watch that, my channel <laughs> yeah, that, that i mean that chinese military history non-western military history in general is as important as any other part of military history and that i think that that, that um, western military history has a particular a, a sort of a, a, a canon you know, there, there are the you know, great campaigns, the great battles, the great commanders that get looked at again and again and again. It's a list that runs from, from ancient Greece really up through uh, World War II. Mm, yeah. and, uh, and there are you know, you know, how many thousands of books have been done about military aspects of the American Civil War or yeah, how it's much a, has been written? It's a huge, the huge of, field. <laughs> Battle of Waterloo or the Battle of Gettysburg. And, and you know, so much um, attention and kind of real talent has you know, gone into extremely you know, detailed you know, studies of those episodes that it's for now very hard to find anything new to say. And uh, Chinese military history is, by comparison, really unexplored. Yeah. This is not to say that there's not some very good work being done by scholars in China. Yeah. But there's so much more still to be done. And um, and there are contributions that can be made by by historians based in the West, especially if they put in the time to learn the necessary languages. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I know also China people very much don't realize the um, how new. Uh, archaeology uh, has gone on in China and how much work there remains to be done that could be done with archaeology and particularly I think like battlefield archaeology and things like this there's um we have some good stuff that goes on in like western Europe and all this other stuff digging up old battles and in China it's um, been mostly focused on graves and right. epitaphs yeah. and things like this. So there's just so much more that we can learn um, with what we, if we just apply some of that knowledge, yeah. so. That's right. But uh, Professor David Graff, I'm super grateful that you were willing to come and, you know, uh, do this interview. It was a lot of fun. I know uh, I've learned a lot from your books and your, this conversation, and I hope that you also um, had a good time. <laughs> I, I certainly did. Yeah. So, yeah. Thanks very much for um, inviting me onto your show.